Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Robinson. I'm Carson Gruba. Welcome to Living the Line. And today we've got the second installment of a yet, yet, as yet unnamed. As uh, yet to be named? <laughs> installment. A, yeah. uh, well, let's just call it uh, badass people uh, drawing uh, while two, <laughs> two guys not fit to wash their jock straps uh, observe yes, and make yes. comments. That's that's uh by the way Dave is referencing what what uh, or Sean is referencing what Dave would say about myself and him in relationship to Alex Raymond and Stan Drake. We were tracing their work but not fit to wash their jock straps. And that is most definitely true of uh the people we will be watching on this feature if we keep doing it. But I think we will. I think people will like this. So today who are we looking at, Sean? Oh my gosh, we're going to be looking at the great Yajuhiko. What is his last name? Oh, I'm sorry, his his first name. I, I'm so embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> uh, Yashukazu yeah, Yashuhiko. Yeah, um, otherwise known as Yaz, uh, who is just an incredible artist. He uh, has had an amazing uh, career in uh, Japan. He started out as an animator. He worked on the original Gundam series, and uh, he became a manga artist and has a quite interesting style and is uh, just has this crazy adherence to his own designs that is quite interesting and uh, i was stunned to see that he had submitted himself to an issue to an episode of uh, monban where he was filmed working for a week and uh watching him work is quite the experience so obviously we want you to watch the monban episode uh, at yes. some point, but uh, specifically uh, watching uh, this, I thought it might be interesting for the two of us to watch it together, uh, given, as uh, we are told in the Monban episode, that he does not do any type of uh, layout or name, uh, as they call it in Japan. Uh, he does not do any kind of layout prior to actually uh, drawing. So he is drawing directly onto the paper for the first time. Uh, and as you can see from uh, the video, he has had a very long career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the crazy thing about, by the way, if, if no one's ever watched a Monban, I'm assuming everyone in our audience has obsessed over this like I did. But uh, if you haven't yet, it's like five seasons of uh, recordings like this where Naoki Urasawa goes and records a mangaka working for a week and then sits and has a conversation with them. And they're some of the most illuminating things I've ever seen in terms of artists working. Uh, if I think if Sean and I had the resources, this is what this channel would be. Probably yeah. it's just us invading famous people's studios. I think Americans oh, yeah. are also better at kind of putting this material out themselves. Like we're a little more obsessed with that than right. But look, look, look at this right here. He's drawing the guy's face. He has not drawn a construction line. Nor Honest. like yeah, like the outline of the the jaw or it... <laughs> he, he he has this light little noodle. I mean, look at the scale. If to get a scale, look at the tip tip of the pencil. His there. fingernail, yeah. Yeah. So so he has he's a he's marked in the, the contour of the of the head on the side that he has to pay attention to right now. And then he's gone straight for the brows. And I think you get an idea as an animator. Uh, why you might approach something like that. I mean, imagine the amount of drawings that this gentleman has done in his entire life and, uh, you know, the speed at which he's required to do so. Going for the brow enables him to get the expression exactly the way that he wants it before he has anything else uh, in it. And then that's allowing him to get the contour of the face. I think right. almost all of us would make the little egg shape for the head and like you said put the the little cross on it that gets you look right. at that he knew there was going to be something in the way too so he didn't finish the head <laughs> the other thing is like he's ruled out the compositions already so he's fixed in this picture plane if he makes the eyes too big and that pushes the to right. where he can't fit the hand in he would have to erase it and start over so his mental ability to project the shapes ahead of time how they're going to fill the composition oh i need to start you know two-thirds over and one-third down or whatever it is is pretty astonishing to me notice the animation tradition here of uh, making sure that the silhouette is clear for the action so he has pushed the hand away from the face and away from the object here 
so that you could theoretically read it uh, with maximum contrast of the image, like had this uh, had darkened out or was seen on a really poor TV set or whatever, you still have the uh, image ready. Like it's, it's still yeah. readable. And that's really, that's something that I always knew, but you bring it up so much on the channel that I didn't really employ it consciously until mm -hmm. we've been doing this for like a year and you keep coming back to it. And uh, it finally landed with me how to use it. And that has totally changed how I approach any image that I lay out um, dramatically. And you can also see how he's piecing out the silhouette in stages, I think. Right. Yeah, so now we've actually uh, <laughs> got the shoulder breaking it up. Um, but, you know, he, he's, he's I, I doubt that he's going to put much detail into that uh, shoulder area. Uh, but you just imagine like that if the hand had been overlapping the face and just how much less effective it would be. Well, and also, like I said, he's doing it in layers. So right. you can take the shoulders away and the silhouette of the hands, the face, and the bowl makes sense. And right. then you could add the shoulders in. So even though it's a close-up of a face, you kind of still do have foreground, middle ground, and background in a right. stage setting sense. And the foreground makes silhouette sense. And then right. the midground combines with that to make sense. And then the background's empty. Um, now we've jumped ahead. Oh, well, thank you, Captioner, for putting that. <laughs> I'm sorry if if you have watched Man Ben or you have not, I guess either way, you're missing out on the, the lovely soothing voice of their the, <laughs> the woman that does the commentary for them. Yeah. This is the one that's nuts. <laughs> so he's he's gonna draw what this is like a scene on a inside of a train or something. A barn, something a that barn. requires heavy perspective. And this the, is the, what he's doing for perspective. They, they're finding the guy inside of the barn, yeah. Okay. Um. But I think <laughs> most of us are but at this point setting, if this is three-point perspective, we're busting out some vanishing points, we're right. getting a ruler, we're making a grid. Like, he puts down, what, ten lines? <laughs> And then immediately starts sketching in a figure with hardly any revision. Yeah, well, and I mean, most of this, if if mental rev is mental revision, you know, if it's if, if it's not fitting the 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 mental picture he has, it's just not getting dark enough to see. You know, he's yeah. he's kind of skating the paper, or the the pencil across the paper. But yeah, it really is amazing that the. the teeniest bit of notation here well and uh, i mean like again the, the sense of scale like how tiny that face actually is like it's half the size of his a third of the size of his thumbnail right and it's got so much like if i drew a face that size it would just be a circle with two dots <laughs> <laughs> and i yeah, can draw it... pretty tiny People who, um, you know, uh, follow a lot of Amer American comic artists, especially people who work in like the industry when it's more common to be inked by a separate person or whatever, you know, might look at these pencils and think, how in the world are these going to be interpreted? But of course, this for him is just the first stage of it, you know, and the ink is the finished drawing. All yeah. these things are going to be just by the wayside. Obviously, if you're handing this off to Joe Schmo, uh, <laughs> you know, you might have a real problem with it. I have to tell you, I, 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 weird, weird high school experience. I actually, um, the first time I ever really understood this as a phenomenon, uh, was when uh, a guy I knew in high school, uh, in junior year of high school, who actually went on to become a professional comic artist, uh, gave me some pages that he had penciled and they looked perfectly adequate to me. And he asked me if I would consider trying to ink a few of them. And all I did was just totally ruin uh, a page and it's funny because it looked like a finished drawing and then when i started putting stuff on there i was like what am i i get like getting lost in his marks you know yeah i'd never had that experience before um and uh you know it just he would have been able to interpret it just fine you know yeah and i think a lot of us myself most definitely included that grew up paying more attention to the american industry and that process of like splitting it up into a team um you know, tended to learn to pencil super tight. 
and right. and it's it's really a detriment to a lot of people as artists i think because then that carries over to if they ever do ink or they they're they don't draw with a sense of what the inking tools do either like this is someone who knows that the work has to happen in the ink because the pencil doesn't mimic the forms that the brush creates right so if if you do too much of that work in pencil then all you can do is like go back and really trace you can't right. express yourself with the tool at hand right and i think you know that took me a long long time to learn is that these and the confidence to draw something this loose and go, yeah I, I i won't fuck it up in the ink or if i do like you know i'll be able to recover it i love that pose there with his arms back like that and uh, well, notice that's... the feet splayed out in a way that that uh, gives you a convincing sense of uh, weight and that he's like done that, like like I said, this is like a very complex perspective shot and all of the figures feel natural within it. Um, he didn't sketch that figure out. <laughs> we can pause that right there. Yeah. Uh, he didn't he didn't sketch out the height of that figure even like you said, construction mark. Like I right. think a lot of people would say, OK, he's that tall. Here's the halfway mark and kind of go from there. Like he just knew the head has to be this big so that by the time I get to the feet, you know. I, right. it's i don't and and also like w when we watch sergio topi he spent so much time noodling with the contours to get the negative shapes and stuff right, right. but here you still have a complex breakdown of silhouettes and negative shapes at all of these different levels and there was no noodling it just kind of comes right. out wholesale i i love those beams by the way the two cross beams the three cross beams that are uh visible there are all compositionally very successful like additions you notice that note there on the bottom 14 minutes to pencil in that that panel yeah that's nuts that whole complex perspective shot and he hasn't he also hasn't done the uh like rough draft either so he, right. the time he's saving is <laughs> i think i spend like you know a day just like laying out oh this is okay there we go just <laughs> fast as hell um god <laughs> Looking at him holding it uh, sideways like that is this is something that I think we were missing when we were fucking around with chopsticks. Right. Because I'd seen an episode of this where someone was drawing with chopsticks. Um, those those uh, things that look kind of like chopstick marks yep. like you can see in the upper left there. That's just him drawing with the brush tilted on yep. the side. Right. Because he gets the wedge. Yeah. Uh, of the of the side when needed. And you can kind of do that with like a Windsor Newton type of brush, but these ones that have the thicker base, I think, lend themselves to that better. Sure, because these... you get the 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 wedge that's available to you has more has more heft to it. Oh, there we go. The Saka Fude. Saka you. I don't know how to say it. So now we've got the performance of the uh, performance of the of the drawing. And Notice I think how... this is. Sorry, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. This is, this is the part that, I don't know. Like, all the sketching and stuff is real impressive, but this is, seeing it come to life like this is the thing that fascinates me the most. I wish we could see his face right now. I would I would bet you good money that he's making that face as he's drawing it. Yeah, sticking his tongue out, holding his mm -hmm. breath. Actually, he doesn't seem like he holds his breath. Do you hold your breath when you draw? I, uh, when I draw a long line, yeah. You catch yourself at the end of it being like, <gasps> yep, yep, yeah. Do you Only twirl for... your brush? What's that? Do you twirl your brush ever? Uh, to reorient the the fibers? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because I haven't um, seen him do that yet. Yeah, I'm but... not sure. Uh, it, um, I don't know. He, he, he. Yeah, that's a good. I'd be curious to try a brush like the one he's using. To see if you need to re-roll it or if just uh -huh. the water, hold, the the liquid holds it together. Right. That's what I was wondering. Is since the reservoir is so much bigger, if uh, mm. that might be part of, you know, part of what the the lack of maintenance that he's doing here. It says somewhere in the episode, I think that he just he just tosses these every, you know, every like uh, five, um, ten pages or whatever. Yeah, when I was doing Strange Death, honestly, if if I could have afforded it and um, 
and we got a shot of his face there. He wasn't doing much. Uh, <laughs> but he wasn't drawing either. Right. Um, yeah, I would. I really had like a, a, a five to 15, depending on the brush before it was just, it wasn't useful for, right. it was a useful brush, but not for the kind of control that was necessary on Strange Death. Um, so he kind of doubles back on some of these lines that he wants to have a certain sort of looseness to it. These wood, these wood lines. It's interesting when you see that. Like um, that right there. Yeah. As a sort of general approach, you know, you, you, you try to train out of that uh, at a certain point because, you you know, you want a calligraphic thing. But then you have to remind yourself like, oh, some things like that's what you do. <laughs> you keep on working, you know, until you uh, until you get it. Oh, and see, now we get the black juicy marks yeah i've i've been always like um hesitant to go back and thicken things up later because whenever i do it it feels clumsy right i'm always impressed by the artists that and i've seen a number of them i'm always like oh what a bad idea but then oh but i love their art so you see, know. He, there are those double lines uh serve to make the sort of broken texture of the uh, you know of the of the line the cross contour um robe line yeah that works for me uh but when he's trying to get it solid so, you know sometimes people that can do that do that it can look gummed up but sure. for him no no because he think he knows exactly what he wants <laughs> yeah. look, look at how he keeps that hair lively by uh staying away from the contour that he already established when he's popping it in so you have these like essentially white lines reaching into the to the black yeah, and just not worried about if there's a. Apparently, he slobbers while he draws. Uh, <laughs> um, not worrying about like right there. I know we're not super close, but you can still see it. Maybe they'll zoom in. But he's not like filling in the lines. Per, yeah, there's yeah. A, so much light like in that bottom left, um, and it looks intentional. But he's just letting things happen and being like, okay, yeah, that looks fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that gives me the effect I want. Yeah, that looks like wood. Cool. This is, this is interesting to me because uh, mentally, uh, you and I have talked about this before, I have to put in the blacks first or I'll over-render. Um, and so making a black um, those large black areas just prevents me from doing unnecessary work, you know? But obviously that's not a, <laughs> that's not a hazard <laughs> for him. <laughs> He's like the most efficient human being who's ever drawn, so. Yeah, but I do tend to black afterwards too. My instinct is to... Uh, do Let's the lines first and then yeah i think we can stop stop it yeah. there with that one but yeah my tendency is to do all the line work first but that's good that's changing the more i focus on silhouette because of you so you, you've influenced me <laughs> but there there is a tendency to focus on lines first and then slap the blacks in at the end uh it is impressive because it does look like the composition i mean if we go back to that final composition yeah let's see it i think you're right that really what holds it all together is these kind of three big wedges of black and he right. knows that all along but um like me and you probably would want to see that right. more ahead of time yep. and then control everything else around it no, he just notice, knows what it's going to look like. <laughs> right, that's true. That's it. That's it. Uh, no, notice the tones aren't doing anything fancy. Um, you essentially have two different uh, weights of tone, and he's just distributing them in the appropriate places. And he's not cutting any highlights, and he's not, uh, or his assistant, or it's not cutting yeah. any highlights, and he's not doing anything other than just using that as a sort of light color or light wash. Which makes sense when your your compositions are so clear. Yeah. Well, and again, as the silhouette factor and silhouette and stages. So you can have basically the room architecture that's the extreme foreground as its own big kind of just interesting abstract shape. Like take away the figures and that's a nice composition. Then he's used it to create the kind of solidity of these two figures. Uh, as their own little sub silhouette that could merge to this silhouette if you wanted to right uh for kind of the mid ground and then everything else is a bit background to that so uh, that's something else i've been paying attention to in the manga is yeah the way they won't really do any rendering it is graphic and it just helps establish a silhouette or it can take things like the man and the woman that might normally be seen as separate and merge them into 
one shape so you kind of get this the their their compositional function becomes more like the totality of the outline of them mm -hmm. instead of two things so it's like a grouping uh, a grouping strategy a compositional grouping strategy i think that they use yeah yeah well man uh what what a pleasure to uh do that and i mean i, I think that we really owe uh you know owe a debt of gratitude to everybody who put together monben uh obviously you know one person above all uh yeah but uh I, I'm really uh, blown away by the show, but also just like getting to see somebody like that draw um, is really something else. It's it's encouraging and intimidating, right? It tells you where you could get to if all you did was draw, um, but intimidating because neither one of us can all we do is draw. <laughs> so, uh, how are we supposed to compete with that? Also, the natural God-given ability that some of these people have to visualize is pretty insane it, it is um and uh, i i hope that he gets many back rubs um because uh I, that's the other thing i was saying, is imagining it's just like the amount of you know amount of time you're putting in at the desk. that's what when when i see these monbin episodes and you get those those people who are like in it's like 78 you know mm -hmm. some of these people like uh Ikegami, he's in his 70s, uh -huh. right? Yep. Some of these, the the dude that does, I forget his name, but he does the Gogol 13. Uh, Saito. Uh, yeah, he's yeah. so old and he's still in there. Like, I don't know how these people hold up. Um, it's impressive. I don't know, because they you watch him work and you're like, you don't have healthy work habits. Some of them, <laughs> you, they, I don't, there's some of them, you haven't watched it all, right? No. There's some of them where they have footage of them like doing their like back stretches in the middle of the day and stuff, um, which is cool. I think that's all important things that get left out of the conversation yeah. about cartooning in a, as a technical art form. Right. Absolutely. And uh, th this stuff is going to be a great resource, like you said in the previous episode, like, you know, imagine being able to peer at Windsor McKay, you know, sitting at his yeah. uh, drawing desk. Um, or, you know, Floyd Gottfriedson or, you know, I mean, the, 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 the fact that somebody sat down and said, look, it, you know, Tezuka drew for 65 years and all we have is, uh, <laughs> you know, this 15 minutes of him drawing. Oh, uh, that will have to be our next one, huh? Yeah. I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, I don't think you're prepared. <laughs> no, I, I've I've seen that. It's okay. like that strength where he has like an apartment in a building that he rents just to be away from his family while he works. And yeah, yeah, I've seen that. We'll have to watch that. That will be a good one. Um, so, anyways, I hope you all are enjoying this new feature. Hopefully, it's something that we'll keep doing. I'm definitely enjoying it. So, uh, yeah, heck yeah. yes, and that's like two thirds of it right there, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So, and we still need a name, by the way. So. Uh, two weeks in now without a name hook us up with the name yeah hit us up in the comments let us know all right, all right. later Have guys everybody make sure to like smash that subscribe button and ring that bell <laughs> <laughs>